Are you awake? I know you're just <laughs> rusty. <laughs> As we keeping you up back there. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, when we come to John chapter 9, I think we, the obvious issue at stake here is this man who was born blind. And the disciples got a little bit sidetracked, I think. They were interested in a theological discussion about this. Right? And uh, they weren't too concerned about the man, unfortunately. At least that's what it seems like. And they, they were more concerned with this man. Uh, like the theological questions behind his congenit congenital blindness. And it's a very interesting story to me. I think the most obvious question that we probably need to ask is why do bad things happen like that to people? I mean, if you're born blind, and the question came up, well, the, they said, well, did this man sin? So was this the direct uh, God punishing this man for some sin? And so he's going to be blind for the rest of his life. Or was this uh, his parents? And did they sin somehow? And now God was punishing the children for the sins of the parents. It was huge questions, wasn't it? And Jesus' answer was, no, it really wasn't the result of sin. Right? Are you with me? So, so if it wasn't him... And it wasn't his parents, but obviously he was born in this condition of blindness from his birth. Where, who can we blame for this? So who started getting the blame in this discussion? It must be God, right? It's got to be God who's doing this. God must have, God must, and, and that's kind of where the discussion came to. Um, so it says in verse 2, and, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And uh, Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents but, and then in my version, it's New American Standard, it's in italics, it was. But it is so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. So, the question they were thinking about was that God must have had a plan and his plan included this man to be born blind so that God eventually could display his glory, his power in this man's life. Um, I, don't, I don't really believe that. I mean, I'm sure God can do that. Um, but... Uh, Bad things happen in this world. If you get a chance and you can go to missionconnection.com and uh, find Brent Strasberg's uh, uh, workshop on why bad things happen to good people, <laughs> it's a great workshop. And I'll just give you a couple of the highlights of that, that uh, teaching. And, and it's like, it, because we're all trying to come to grips why, with why bad things happen to people. What's the reason? Is there a connection between sin and suffering? Is there a connection between my parents' sin and what I'm going through? And we're always trying to connect those dots. Um, so even uh, an apologetic on this course, um, I think, falls short. As good as these answers are, I don't know. I think we need something more than just these answers. Uh, but
but they're still good answers. Here's the, the four reasons that Brandt talks about. You can write them down if you'd like, but reason number one is that people choose to do bad things sometimes. Uh, some of you might have heard that the son of the coach of the Kansas City Chiefs was in a, a allegedly a DUI accident this week and uh, severely injured a couple of innocent little kids. Uh, they, they were sitting alongside of the freeway somewhere, I think in the Kansas City area, and uh, he drove getting onto some freeway in hit this uh, car and two of the kids were severely injured. They were in critical condition. Uh, so sometimes, right? Are you with me? Sometimes people choose, people choose to do bad things. And so some of the suffering in our world is the result of people making choices. People that have a free will. People that decide to do things that are are evil. So that's one answer. This, the uh, second one is, um, just a second, these are pretty small, so um, the second one is our broken world causes bad things. We live in a broken world, and I think we can see it politically, we can see it in the field of medicine and disease, where we live in a fallen, broken world. And sometimes just living here can result in tough things. Right? Um, so that was the second thing. The third thing is that God does not always choose to intervene. He's not the kind of God that intervenes in every single event in our life. Can you imagine what that would be like if God chose to intervene just before people chose to do things or before things happened? I mean, it would just be a completely different world, but he doesn't always choose to intervene. <clears throat> and then finally, God can use bad things to achieve greater purposes. God can use um, bad things to achieve greater purposes. Now, I'm going to talk to you for a minute about this. Um, because sometimes you may be tempted, maybe you've done this in the past, uh, maybe you have been tempted to use verses in the Bible as band-aids because people are going through tough things. Have you ever been tempted? Have you ever done that? You turn, open your Bible and say, uh, what are some things that you might come up with? I'll give you a chance to respond. Like someone's been diagnosed with a disease or something or or something bad happens, they're in the hospital, maybe they got virus. Yes? This is the one I always says wrong. God never gives you more than you can handle. Okay, but is that a Bible verse? Okay. But we do say that, right? God won't give you more than you can handle. We we tend to say that a lot. What else? What Bible verses do we go to? Romans three twenty three. Okay, what was that, Steve? How does that go? I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah. God works all things for good, most of them. Yeah, 828. Sorry, you were in the right way. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, and that's the one I wanted us to think about this morning. So you hit, you got the right verse. We, we say, what do we say? God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose, right? And so someone is in the hospital, and we come up to them, and we say, well, you know. Yeah, I'm going to read a scripture for you. It says... Um, um, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to, be, to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many uh, brethren. 
And, uh, but yeah, especially verse 28, we would say God causes all things. So whatever you're going through, God's going to bring good out of it. Right? Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you to do something. I want you to take that verse and I want you to just put it in your pocket. And I don't think it's a good thing to pull that verse out and just share that with someone who's going through difficulties. And I'm, I'm not saying that the Bible is bad or that that verse is wrong. I totally agree with it. But instead of taking that verse out, I think it would be good. Because look what Paul says. This is the Apostle Paul. What did the Apostle Paul have to say to the church at Rome? The church that was undergoing suffering under Nero. The church that was undergoing persecution and death. Christians were being um, captured and uh, sometimes put on poles and uh, used as lamps, burning lamps in the streets of Rome. They were suffering horrible persecution. And the Apostle Paul, you know, he could say um, things like this. Um, I don't know why I go to the wrong book every time, but I... Who said that? Yeah, yeah. Terry, did you say that? I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, where is the long list of Paul's um, difficulties that he went through? Shipwreck and... Yeah, I think it's uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 26, verse 24, five times, Paul said this, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from such uh, external things, there, has, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. I love Paul. I mean, I think when I read that list, and he wasn't boasting, he was just saying, this is reality. Who is weak without my being weak? And who is led into sin without my intense concern? Wow, what a pastor. What a shepherd. And what a person who had been through a tremendous amount of difficulties as an apostle of Christ. And yet, when he wrote to the Roman believers in Romans chapter 8, he said something that I think is really important. Paul wrote, and we know. We know something to be true. We know that it's true. We know, he said, we know 
it's not like, well, we studied this and I have a, you know, it says right here in my Bible, I've got it underlined that this is true about God. Paul said, no, we know something to be true. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So Paul, Paul was really just giving a testimony saying, I know that God works all these things together for good. So if you have a friend in the hospital or someone who's just been diagnosed with something difficult, it's not our job to go and, and teach theology. I think what we need to, the, our job is to pray that they would know, that they would know and experience the truth that God causes all things to work together for good. Do you see the difference? It's not like, well, I have a band-aid for you. No, what you, what we need is to know for ourselves that God works all things for good for the believer. Isn't that good? Do you feel scolded? It wasn't meant to be scolding at all. I didn't mean that. I just mean that Paul said, we know something to be true. The Romans knew something to be true. We, they knew from experience that God causes all things to work together for good. So I guess all I'm saying is that if we find someone who's been blind from birth, they don't need to know this scripture verse. They need to know God. They need to know the God who can work all things for good to those who love God. You see what I'm saying? I think it's really easy to kind of have a band-aid approach to all these things. So we just need to know God in the middle of our difficulty and our friends' difficulties. Pray that they would know the presence of God, that they would know the God who can come alongside, the Holy Spirit who can come alongside of them and minister to them in their deepest, darkest days. We don't just throw verses. We pray that God would minister to them in very deep ways. And then, and then they would be able to say, I know that God has caused all things to work together for the good, for good in my life, in my experiences. But I think it's a really dangerous thing to say, now you know God will work all these things for good. And we don't know what it's like to really to be in their skin, to be in their circumstances, to be in the difficulties that they're facing. So anyway, let's go back to John chapter 9. And uh, we will take a little bit of time here and we will end up at the cross. Okay? At communion. At remembering the one who suffered for us, the one who did not avoid pain. Uh, so let's look at John chapter 9. Okay, so the first, the, the issue here in this section is that you kind of, first of all, you come across the, um, this uh, conflict that took place. Uh, this is a period of time in Jesus' life. It's called a period of conflict. It's growing, deepening conflict over Christ Jesus. Uh, Jesus had already ruffled feathers by uh, telling a man on the Sabbath that he had healed to pick up his mat and pick up and carry his mat home, which was against Sabbath regulations that had happened earlier in the book of John. Now we have Jesus <laughs> making mud on the Sabbath. And making mud involved literally because it was a sin to knead bread. Anybody ever make bread and knead the bread? You know, uh, I've done a little bit of that lately. But um, yeah, so, but the Jews, uh, in order to protect God's people from breaking the Sabbath said you may not 
need <coughs> bread or work to do the kneading on the Sabbath. And so in this passage, you have Jesus <laughs> picking up dirt, spitting in his hand, and kneading this dirt into spittle, into clay. And it happened on the Sabbath. And you can see the foolishness, uh, I think, of somehow the minds of God's people sometimes. It's, it's frightening to me what we, where we can go. Um, so uh, Jesus did that. Um, the man who is called Jesus. So there's just this event that took place and the conflict between Jesus and his opponents uh, intensifies. Um, there is the development in this passage of belief and the development of greater darkness and unbelief. And so that's what happens. Jesus does that. He either, the same sun, what do they say, uh, melts the wax or hardens the clay. It's the same sun and you have the melting and the hardening going on in this uh, passage. It's very clear. So, uh, of course, we know that this is a sign. It was a sign that John recorded. A sign is something that happened that uh, helped us understand something else. So this sign, of course, uh, for those who believe, understand that uh, it was a sign of Jesus' power. His power over blindness his power over physical impairment. And so there's this interview, and then there's a crisis uh, which brought some fresh understanding, both positive and negative, to this case. So the case was, um, again, we'll just look at what happened. Here's, here's the characters in this story. The first ones that we'll look at are the disciples. Uh, they were really concerned with theological analysis. They were wondering who sinned. Whose fault was this? Um, the disciples were bewildered by the seeming irrationality of an affliction. And we can do that. You ever, you ever have that? Do you ever have <laughs> irrationality? Are you ever bewildered with uh, the irrationality of someone who's going through difficulty? Have you ever been there? Yeah, um, I could share some personal stories about that in my own family. Um, so it's the, the disciples were bewildered by the seeming irrationality of an affliction which had befallen a man from birth and uh, could not be, uh, that could not be traced to some definite sin. So they were kind of suffering this bewilderment and <clears throat> um, they were, and, and I hope this isn't you and me, but they were more occupied with solving the abstract problem than in ministering to the individual that had aroused it. And I wonder if we could be that way, where we, we will wrestle with theological issues, we will talk about important things up here, but, but these guys were more occupied with solving an abstract problem than in ministering to the individual who had a need. And so in short, <laughs> here's what one uh, commentator wrote, they regarded him as a sinner who was less important than their debate. Very interesting, isn't it? So the disciples had some uh, learning and growing to do. If you have a place to write some notes, I'm going to have you write down uh, six, you know, steps along the way because the, the disciples began at a certain point but ended up at a more uh, good point, okay? So, and it had to do with uh, the disciples... Um, 
Well, actually, this isn't the disciples. This is, sorry, this is the, the man himself. Sorry, the man, the blind man. So the first one is in uh, chapter 9, verse 11. Okay, sorry. Uh, 9, 11. <clears throat> uh, 10 says, So they were saying to him, How then were your eyes opened? How did this happen? How did you come to the place of being able to see after a whole life of being in darkness? And he answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go, in, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. So what did he think about Jesus? Well, all he said at this point is, the man, right? <clears throat> the man who is called Jesus. <clears throat> I think he was able to, um, you know, he couldn't see, but he could hear. <clears throat> and he could learn a lot of things with his other senses. But at this point, all you have is that he was a human who did him good. That's all he knew at this point, verse 11. By the time you get to verse 17, <clears throat> here's what he said. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? So the, the people, the Pharisees were interested in what this blind man had to say about him with a capital H since he opened your eyes. And he said, now he's more than a man, right? What is he? He's a prophet, okay? So <clears throat> by verse 17 in this inter in interaction, um, he says he's a prophet. He's a, a spokesman for God. He is maybe on a par with Elijah or Elisha or one of the Old Testament prophets. So he's a prophet. Now I want you to drop down to verse 24 and following. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. So the Pharisees were trying to say trying to come to the conclusion that, he, that Jesus is a sinner. Why would they say that? Because he was kneading mud or dirt on the Sabbath. And in their minds, even though he did a miracle, he's got to be a sinner because he broke the law. He broke the Sabbath. And they were, they were trying to uh, dis credit Jesus. So verse 25, and then he then answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. <laughs> That's up to you guys. You're the religious guys, right? Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. But one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. That's my testimony. I can say, I used to be blind, and now I can see. That's all I can, my answer is simply that way. So they said in verse 26, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? What are they getting at? They're trying to pin Jesus for violating the Sabbath. That's what I mean. How did he do this? They wanting, they're wanting him to be, uh, to incriminate Jesus. And then verse 27, he answered them, I told you already, <laughs> and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not, you do not want to become his disciples, do you? And I think the implication here in this section is that Jesus is a teacher with disciples. He is someone who is a rabbi, he's a teacher, and he has disciples. And so by now, he's even saying, you don't want to become his disciples, do you? And then finally, not finally, uh, verse 30, 30, 
The man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from. And yet, he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he, he could do nothing. Can you see a little bit of development in this man's thinking? He is from God. He is a devout man who does God's will and comes from God. I think it's an amazing journey here in this, the development of this man's faith. Verse 36 uh, is another one. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent? Sorry, I'm in chapter 10. Wrong chapter. Uh, verse 36. Thank you. He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said, Well, who is he, Lord? <laughs> he is a man worthy of respect. It's the word kurie. Who is he, Lord? He's calling, talking to Jesus as Lord or Master, or it's a, it's a term of respect that he used when speaking with Jesus. And then finally in verse 38, and uh, before I read that, I want to remind you as I do over and over again that John selected the signs that we find in the Gospel of John in order to uh, underscore something. He said, therefore, chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That was the purpose, the purpose of the book of John. And so when we get to John 9, verse 38, here is, it's been accomplished in the life, in the belief of this man. Look at John chapter 9 and verse 37. Jesus said to him, you have, I want to make sure I got the right verse, yeah. So verse 37, you have both seen him and he is the one who is talking to you. And he said, Lord, Kurie, Kurios. It is uh, the word L, capital L O R D, uh, a divine figure worthy of trust, of faith, and worship. Look what he says. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he what? He worshiped him. He worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into the world so that those who do not see may see. And that those who see may become blind. So the man went from, he's a human benefactor who did me good, to he's a prophet, to he's a teacher with disciples, to he's a devout man who does God's will and comes from God, to he is a, a worthy of respect, and finally he is a divine figure, he is the Lord, he is worthy of trust, pistuo, belief, and worship. That's quite a journey, isn't it? And that happened in the man who was born blind. So. I can't say it for him, but I think if we talk to him, he could say, God has caused all things to work together for the good of those who love God. I can't say it for him, right? Mm -hmm. 
but he would say it. So that's the man born blind. Then there's the neighbors, the people around, and they call him a beggar in verse 8. Okay? Uh, the neighbors in uh, verse 8. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar, they were used to him. They saw him. They knew all about him. You know, they drove by the street corner where they would panhandle, right? And, and, and got tired of the guilt feelings of driving past, I guess. And they were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? So the neighbors just said, oh yeah, he's the beggar. Um, he's the one that's dependent on us for generosity and support. Uh, there probably was little feeling towards him, uh, probably saw him as a nuisance. They probably looked at him as unproductive, unproductive member of society, he's just a beggar, he's always begging. Um, that he contributes nothing to the life of the community. He's just one more mouth to feed. I mean, I think that's kind of how the neighbors viewed this guy. And you can judge for yourself whether that might be an appropriate way to look at someone like that. And then you have the Pharisees. Okay, here's the other group. Um, this man was not really someone to have compassion for. This was someone to be used as a tool in discrediting, incriminating Jesus. Um, I don't think they had the slightest interest in him, only in the sense that he could be a witness to getting healed on the Sabbath and uh, incriminating Jesus. Um, so when the man was found to be not useful to their purposes, what happened to him? when he didn't give them the answers they wanted to incriminate Jesus in this conflict, what did they do to the man? They booted him out. They excommunicated him. Probably it was a more temporary out of the synagogue. There was a formal ban that the Sanhedrin had to vote on, and he probably was more like the first incident. But uh, when the man was found to be not useful to their purposes, they excommunicated him. They kicked him out of the synagogue. Isn't that amazing? You have the man who was blind from birth, who meets Jesus, who is miraculously healed by God and experiencing all of that, what it means to be able to see again. And the Pharisees, in questioning him, found that he wasn't a useful tool to them, and they excommunicate him. The conflict is between the Pharisees and Jesus, obviously. And, so, and then finally you have Jesus. Um, I, I just, I don't know how I can tell you that we need to look at Jesus. We need to see him. We need to study him. We need to watch how he interacts with people because we're, we are uh, destined, I think predestined, according to Romans, to conformity to the image of Christ. We're not going to be God. We're not going to be gods. We're not little gods in the making. But God's purpose for our lives is to to transform us into the image, into the likeness of Christ. And um, so I love it when verse 1 of chapter 9, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. He saw a man. He noticed a man. He was passing by and he stopped. It was not just a nuisance, another mouth to feed, a blind beggar, who was a bother, but Jesus um, saw that he would, saw this man. And I think that's what Jesus, Jesus saw him as a person who needed his ministry. Um, the man's condition called for action rather than discussion. I think that's going on here. The man, his condition called for action 
rather than for discussion. It wasn't his sin, and it wasn't his parents' sin, and it wasn't God causing this blindness, I don't believe. I think it was that an opportunity, that's all I'm going to read into this, that his blindness, when he came in contact with Jesus, was an opportunity for God to be merciful to him and to declare his glory during the time that Jesus had left on the earth. He was doing what the Father commanded him to do. We must work, which I think Jesus was saying, I must work while the light is, while it's daylight. Until the darkness comes, the darkness of the cross, the darkness of leaving. Um, so uh, I think it was an opportunity for Jesus to uh, demonstrate his glory and to meet the need of this man. And Jesus didn't explain, he just changed the man's condition. Isn't that great? One commentator wrote this, he said, his suffering is the occasion and not the appointed preparation for the miracle. You got that? Are you with me? Are you awake? Come on. His suffering is the occasion and not the appointed preparation for the miracle, though when we regard things from the divine side, we are constrained to see them in their dependence on the will of God. And so then there's the blind man. We've already seen his growth, his growth in belief. And uh, the, the motive for this cure, this healing was compassion. The means was dirt, mud. Um, and so we have the miracle. We have the reason for the miracle stated by John that it was so that we might believe something important about Jesus, that he is the son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he is the one sent by God, the one that the whole Old Testament pointed forward to. Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that through him we might have life in his name. I'm going to just tell you that um, there's the physical part of this um, you know, the physical part of this miracle. There is blindness, physical blindness, and there is physical healing. Okay, but we've already said that uh, before that um, it's also a picture of redemption spiritually. We know that we've been, we are blinded by Satan that our eyes have been blinded, our minds have been blinded to the truth of the gospel, that a human being, apart from the grace of God, the working of God himself, is blind and left in his blindness. And there is something that happens uh, that opens our eyes and helps us to believe on Christ and we see the transformation of God. Remember, uh, there was a man, he's kind of an ugly dude, to be honest with you, I mean, I guess I'm sorry if I said that about you, sorry. I don't think his picture is very flattering. Um, and uh, he, he was born in 1725, and he died in 1807. And uh, I think that he experienced the transformation of God, the opening of blind eyes, and the, the work of God on his behalf. He ended up writing, let me see how many I have here. I have 61, maybe there's more than that. Yeah, 61 at least hymns that he wrote. And uh, he experienced the transforming work of God in his life. Um, some of you know who I'm talking about. Um, his name was John Newton. Uh, he was born into a Christian home, 
But his godly mother died when he was seven. And he joined his father at sea when he was 11. And his licentious and tumultuous sailing life included a flogging for attempted desertion from the Royal Navy and captivity by a slave trader in West Africa. And after his escape, he himself became the captain of a slave ship. Several factors contributed to Newton's conversion. A near drowning in 1748, the piety of a, his friend Mary Catlett, whom he married in 1750, and his reading of Thomas a Kempis' Imitation of Christ. In 1754, he gave up the slave trade and in association with Wilbur, William Wilberforce, uh, eventually became an ardent abolitionist after becoming a tithe surveyor in Liverpool, England. Newton came under the influence of George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley and began to study for the ministry. He was ordained in the Christian church, uh, sorry, he was ordained in the Church of England and served in Olney from 1764 to 1780 and St. Mary Woolnorth uh, in London from 1780 to 1807. His legacy to the Christian church includes his hymns as well as his collaboration with William Cowper in publishing only hymns to which Newton contributed 280 hymns, including, including Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Where is, where is the hymnal? Is there one around here? I know. Uh, I, I hear it is. Never mind. I want to say all the words I meant to do that. So here's what he wrote. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. And what did he say next? I was blind. And now I see. He said I was blind. I was spiritually blind. And apart from the, the movement of God into the life of a sinner, there's no hope, is there? Apart from, we are born blind. I hate to say that. I'm not afraid to say that, but we are born in sin. We are born separated from God. We are born with a sin nature. We are born blinded to the truth. People are born blind. And John Newton had to come to the place where he could say, and we could sing with him, I was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, it sounds like Paul, right? I have already come. T'was grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind but now I see Father thank you that you are the God who invades our lives you are the God who for many of us a long time ago invaded our life and our world and you uh, opened our hearts to believe the things that we heard in the Word of God. 
Lord, you, you opened our hearts to believe the gospel, to believe that we are sinful and in need of a Savior, and that, God, you are holy and righteous and pure and without sin, and you are righteous, and that apart from your grace, we are blind until we die. Apart from your grace, we will leave this world in our blindness and in our rejection and in our unbelief. Father, we thank you for the cross. We're going to celebrate again the cross of the Lord Jesus that you did not spare. In a sense, you were passive, that you allowed this to happen to your son as part of your eternal plan. You did not spare your own son, but gave him up for us all. Father, thank you that there is life, there is forgiveness, there is adoption into your family. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of the word of God and that we can say this morning, everyone who comes to the table this morning can say, I once was blind, but now I see. Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the substitutionary atoning death of Christ in the place of sinners. Father, thank you for the blood. Thank you, Lord, that it's finished, that on the cross you said it is finished. The work of redemption is finished. We come empty-handed and grateful to the table this morning. And Lord, we thank you for um, the, the hope that we have, the sure, confident hope that we have of heaven and eternity with you. Lord, I just thank you for that. Thank you for this man, this blind man, born blind, who met Jesus and who was forever transformed not only to be able to see physically, but to see spiritually the glory of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, as we come to the table, as we come to partake of the, the cup and the bread, um, I just pray, Lord, that we would come with grateful hearts, that we would come remembering Christ, in remembrance of Jesus, with Jesus on our minds and Jesus in our hearts. It is Jesus, the Son of God, whom we celebrate at the communion table this morning. We love you, Lord. I pray your blessing on us as we partake together of communion. In Jesus' name, amen.